Well, thank you for joining us. We have a, a guest today who is a, kind of a rarity for our interviews. He's a native-born Polk County, and I think, am I correct? I, I, will, I will have him tell you the story in just a minute, but I want to introduce you to Chris Bartol, uh, one of the first persons I met when, uh, when I moved here. I've heard about him, and I hadn't talked to him much, but I saw a lot of his work. And we're going to talk partly about that today, too. So he's a man of many talents. And so, Chris, thank you so much for giving us some of your time today. And um, first of all, you were born here in Polk County, were you not? No, I wasn't. <laughs> we're off to a great start. Anyway, it's good to see you again, <laughs> Dini. And I hope we have the sound on this time. But, uh, no, uh, I, am, I wasn't born here, but I got here just as fast as I could. My mother, uh, who uh, was raised here in Tryon, uh, uh, happened to be in New Jersey visiting my father because it was in 1941, um, and uh, we were in. New, he was, she was in New Jersey when I happened to pop out, okay. and uh, um, I moved down here when I was about one and a half, I think. <laughs> you didn't have much say-so in it, did you? <laughs> I had very little to say about that. My mother uh, was raised here. Uh, her mom and dad were here. And, of course, when, when my dad uh, enlisted in the Navy uh, after uh, December 11th, I mean December 7th, okay. rather, 1941, um, then uh, she moved back here to stay with her mom and dad while... Uh, my father was in. It was in the Pacific. Um, I was born in July '41, and uh, then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor in December. And I kind of had some uh, had to think about that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I say I'm from Tryon. Um, well, you were, you moved here when you were young enough to um, almost be a, a native born. Well, pretty much so. I, I moved here. I mean, I visited when I was very very little obviously, but we moved here when I was about three. Mm -hmm. And uh, we lived, uh, interestingly enough, in the house that uh, um, my mother's father had built. Now, uh, what was her maiden name? Her name was, er, her, her maiden name was Erskine. Erskine. Mm -hmm. Her dad was uh, Ralph Erskine. And uh, Ralph Erskine had built a house here in town called the Villa Barbara. And is it still standing? It is still standing, and um, my sister Mimi uh, still has the house, still has the home place. It's called the Villa Barbara. It's on Erskine Road. And uh, my grandfather built the house for his wife, uh, Barbara uh, Petey, who was the sister of Donald Colrose Petey, who was a naturalist and wrote many books, uh, one particularly on Pearson's Falls. Anyway, to make a long story short, um, my uh, grandfather's uh, first wife had four sons, and uh, when they were very young, um, uh, m my grandfather's first wife uh, died on Christmas Eve, 1916. Uh, she had an infection, she got a small cut, and she passed away, and it was very uh, discouraging for my grandfather, and he pretty much abandoned the house that he had built for them. When my mother, uh, my mother was the product of his second marriage about four years later. And so uh, my mother grew up having three half-brothers, and it was a, just a wonderful family. They lived down to what was, was called Packlet Plantation down on Harmon Field Road. My grandfather really uh, could never go back to the house because he had built it for his first wife, Barbara, and it just meant so much to him. My mother was horseback riding um, when she was about 14 or 15 years old and came upon this house on the hill and came down and asked her parents about it. And they explained that it had been built by her father for his first wife. And uh, anyway, um, she was enamored with the house. And interestingly enough, when my mother and my, and my father were married, he being from New York, they wanted to move down here. And... That wonderful old house happened to be available for sale, and uh, my father's parents bought the house and the property as a wedding gift 
and that's where I grew up. Oh, how neat. That's a neat story. Uh, you have a lot of history. We could probably talk for hours just about that. And that's one of the th reasons I love doing this, because we are getting people to talk about this history, and I think it's nice to hear it from actual relatives or descendants of, of these earlier people. So, But you have lived here then uh, all your life since you were three. I mean, I mean, you were you started living here at three, but you did leave and come back. I think I uh, I grew up here. I went to elementary school. Uh, my father felt that uh, uh, I needed to um, have what he thought was a better education, so I was sent off to Asheville School for Boys when I was about thirteen. And um, even though I was close by, I came back on vacations. Uh, I really uh, was in Tryon until I was about 18 or 19 when I went off to college. Okay. What were you, you're now, of course, a well known uh, photographer and uh, videographer and uh, um, actor and uh, many talents. And we, we, won't, we won't cover your whole career on this. But maybe we can do this again and catch up with your second career. But uh, I'm always interested in people who are here, maybe who have lived here or just moved here. Why, you know, what brought you back? Well, this is just an absolutely wonderful place to be uh, and to live. Uh, I um, uh, last lived in, in the High Point in North Carolina when I was involved with a major studio there uh, doing photography. Well, let's, let's back up a minute. We, we, we missed a few years here. You finished your college. You came back. And had you then decided what you wanted to do with your life, or was this to come later? I've always wondered why people choose their profession. Well, I chose my profession uh because I think of the interest of my father and my grandfather uh, uh, doing photography. And uh, so I wanted to understand and how to become a photographer and how does one. And uh, when I was in college, uh, I went off. Uh, I elected to go on to um, uh, Brooks Institute of Photography in Santa Barbara, California, when I was about 24. At the time, I was married. And... Um, Went to school for three and a half, four years, learning all the aspects of uh, photography. Uh, my first job was Albuquerque. Second job was uh, Philadelphia. Third job was High Point. I was getting closer and closer to Tryon. And uh, <clears throat> anyway, when my mom, uh, uh, my father uh, passed away in 1974, and uh, uh, mom was still alive. And at, at that point, 1985, I thought, you know, at the time of my life, uh, I perhaps want to go out on my own, hang out my own shingle, if you will. Pardon me. During this time, you were in Albuquerque, California, and so forth, working your way back to Polk County. Indeed. <laughs> During that time, were you um, a freelancer, did, or were you working for other people in the photography line at that time? Uh, up until I decided to move back to Tryon, I worked for other people. I worked for major studios in Albuquerque. I was with the, I was a photo technician um, working with uh, EG and G. Uh, they were the ones that uh, actually uh, exploded the nuclear devices in this country, oh. uh, which was uh, interesting. It was uh, I started uh, EG and G's Edgerton, Gemmers, Housen, and Greer, and Harold Edgerton was a math teacher at MIT, and he was the one that invented uh, the strobe a light. Oh. And uh, anyway, I went to work for that company. Uh, then I moved on to a studio in Springfield, Illinois, and uh, to, be, to do mostly commercial work, ended up doing, unfortunately, mostly weddings. And so I moved on to Philadelphia to a major commercial studio in downtown Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. But uh, to answer your question, I have worked for someone um, on behalf of someone all of my career until 1983 when I decided to come back to Tryon. My mom was still alive, and I thought I could do commercial work and work out of Greenville and Spartanburg and Charlotte and Atlanta. Um, so uh, that's when I ended up here in Tryon. Yeah. Uh you uh, specialize, you were talking about being weddings and, and commercial and that, that sort of thing. Uh, have, was it mostly still photography you were doing at that time? Was that kind of the big <clears throat> thing? Have you kind of branched off into this video work uh, in later years? Uh, it's always been still photography. And um, at, at my age, I was getting to the point where I was thinking about retiring. And, and I had uh, uh, a 
most wonderful invitation from some friends that I had met maybe a year or two earlier who were, who were doing video. Um, I know very little about video. However, the company uh, that was interested in me um, were very good at uh, doing video. They were very good at editing, but they needed one more piece of the puzzle. They needed someone who was good at photography, who understood, who understood lighting and f-stops and composition and ratios. And so they came to me, hat in hand, and said, well, Chris, um, we could sure use you. Would, you. would you consider being director of photography for Turner HD Media? And that I name s- sounds familiar. And I said, of course. Located in Polk County. <laughs> They're located in Polk County, and uh, they were up, up and coming business, Lynn and Eric. And Lynn came to me and uh, had in hand, as I said, and she said, would you consider working for us? And I said, of course. She said, here's the deal. No salary, no vacation, and no benefits. I said, boy, it sounds great to me. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a thriving business. <laughs> well, I've, I've, I've had the best time. You say that... Uh, uh, you mentioned that perhaps I knew something about video. I I, I am learning that part of it. Uh, what I am helping uh, Lynn and Eric with is my expertise when it comes to lighting. For instance, if they're doing an interview, um, it's like it's like a like I'm setting up to do a portrait. However, this portrait is moving, and so it's the lighting that's important. It's the posing that's important. It's it's uh, how the subject is looking at the camera uh, versus um, not understanding how to pose someone, shall we say. And I was going to, you kind of preceded uh, my next question because, you know, we see everybody takes pictures now. I mean, I've never seen as many cameras on telephones mm-hmm. or whatever they're on in my life. Uh, nothing goes un- unpictured. If that, I'll make a new word, unpictured. Is that okay? <laughs> but... Um, there is a neck. Uh, there's more to taking a. Uh, I would think as much taking to still picture as taking a moving picture. But there's more than just aiming a camera and flicking that little shutter, isn't there? You're absolutely right, Deanie. Uh, uh, a digital has been a wonderful uh, 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 situation for many, many people because you can you can see exactly what you've done. In real time. Um, having said that, one one that has a digital camera, whether it be a still or a video, does not make that person a photographer or a videographer. They're a picture taker. They're a picture taker. And uh, uh, it's like, you know, uh, someone that uh, has a camera, but they go out and buy a very expensive camera with wonderful lenses, unless they know how to take pictures in the first place, a more expensive camera is not gonna, is not gonna fill the bill. Not gonna help them. Uh, there's, uh, just in uh, the last, I would say five years, or maybe even less, um, you have seen uh, great advances in your art, <clears throat> haven't you? I mean, and the, the means to do it. The means to do it. Um, I I was asked to do a program for our local camera club. Um, I don't know, five or six years ago, and they wanted me to talk about the difference between film and digital. And um, my story was that I said, "Ladies and gentlemen," I said, "Nothing has changed in photography in 150 years." And there was this blank stare from everybody. <laughs> and I said, "How you compose?" Uh, how you understand lighting, how you understand f-stops and depth of field and shutter speeds, all these things, nothing has changed except for one of our tools. And the fact is that having understanding that new tool is fine, but you've got to understand the techniques and everything involved to operate that tool. Well, photography has become um, an art. I mean, it's always been, uh, maybe, but it seems to me that photography has come into its own in the last, mm, I don't know how many years, but do you feel that there have been, uh, that it's more accepted as a true art form? Am I wrong or right or what? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think that uh, when photography first came on, uh, um, you know, back uh, in, in the the uh, mid-1800s, uh, the fact that 
that was not considered. I mean, art, uh, art was oil or pastel or charcoal and things like this. Photography was not an art. Obviously, uh, photography has become an art. And now the digital is here. Um, I, th I still think you can consider it an art, but what has happened is if you understand Photoshop, you can anybody can take a picture and manipulate it to make it look better or different or whatever. So um, back, you know, 15 years ago when I took a picture, I had light meters and I had color meters and I had, because when I took the picture, that was it. I mean, I... That was the picture I took, and it was very little. Do I, you didn't doctor it up. I, I could doctor it perhaps in the dark room when I did printing, but if you were taking transparencies or color, mm -hmm. what you took was what you got. And, you know, for many times you didn't know what you got until three days later when you got it back from the lab. Uh -huh. That was too late. Nowadays, when you take a picture, uh, you may not have to worry about uh all the color and all the ratios and all the exposure because some of these new programs now like Photoshop CS uh, you can manipulate it from from the ground up I mean if you miss it by three stops or if you don't have the right color or if you don't have the right depth of field you can still manipulate it um. We're, you know, we could talk for hours on this. Photography is such a... Uh, he's going to get really wound up now because he just ate a chocolate-covered coffee bean <laughs> full of caffeine. They're good, aren't they? Uh, what is the most difficult assignment you ever had to take? Um, I don't know how to, to, to question this, or to put it to you as a question, but was there ever a time when you thought, I don't think I can do this, or uh, the people you worked with, or the situation, or... Uh, is there anything that stands out in your mind? I've, yeah, I have an interesting interesting story. We were, when I was uh, in photography at a studio in Philadelphia, we did a lot of commercial work for ad agencies and uh, such. And one agency brought us a, a cube of metal, two inches by two inches by two inches. And it was a metallurgy uh, firm and the advertising agency said, we need to have you take a picture of this cube and make it look like a diamond. I mean, really make it look wonderful. <laughs> so that was that, that was my assignment. I shot it, and I thought I, it looked pretty good. And uh, the client didn't like it. It's all right. So they came back, and, and I tried a different technique. And, and I thought it looked pretty yeah. pretty darn good. Anyway, um, they came back, and he said, no, it just doesn't have the pizzazz. It just doesn't have the have the sparkle that we want. Uh, and at this point, you were probably saying, if you want a picture of a diamond, to let, bring me a diamond. Is that the way you felt at that point? Well, <laughs> I learned a very difficult lesson. I said uh, very naively and uh, perhaps uh, a little snooty, I said, you know, well, you know, it can't be done like you want and uh, our photography studio was affiliated with a lab that did work for other studios and, and other clients. A week later, I was down in the lab, and for goodness sakes, there is this cube that some other photographer had taken, and it looked like a diamond. I mean, it looked absolutely gorgeous, and I said, how did they shoot this? And the lab guy knew the photographer and knew how it was done. He called me up. I said, yeah, I'll tell you how I did it. He said, all I did was crumple up a piece of tin foil and flatten it out and stick the cube on it and light it. And then we just etched out the tin foil. And I said, well, I've learned a lesson. I'll never say it can't be done. I, from now on, I'll say maybe I can't do it. <laughs> Would you call that a diamond in the rough? Well, that's, <laughs> that's like a good point, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I think what I learned was that uh, some humility there and to sometimes figure if you can't do it, find out. you have to either you find out how to do it or you, or you man up and say, I can't do what you want. No. Maybe somebody else can. No. 
But you learn a good, you know, that's a point. We have the setbacks in life, and something usually good comes out of those setbacks. Sometimes at the time it doesn't seem that way. But um, sometimes it, I think it helps us to fail in something, don't you? No, I'm not all the time, but, but that was a, a lesson you learned right away, wasn't it? I, I'm not sure if it helps us to fail, but we certainly... No, it doesn't help you to fail, but when you fail, it helps you to learn from that, to maybe go on. That's absolutely okay. right. I mean, every time we do fail, we obviously yeah. need to learn something yeah. from it. And uh, I have one interesting story, too, that uh, um, my daughter worked for a company locally, and uh, uh, she was the art director for her. Uh, for this project, and one of the things we had to take a picture of was this um, incense thing. It, it was it uh, it was sold by a company that uh, did firewood access. I mean, fireplace accessories. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have a real fireplace, you could do this incense and make your home uh, make uh, make it smell like oak or cedar. Yeah. And so I was using a strobe, and I knew how to do it, but these lights that I use have fans in them. And I wanted the smoke to curl up lazily. And it, they were blowing They up. were blowing away. And so I would put stuff in between to keep the wind going, you know, from going. And I said, oh, gosh, I'm having a difficult time. And my daughter just looked at me and she said, Dad, why don't you put glass in front of the lights? The light will shine through, but it'll keep the wind away. And I said, oh, my goodness. Well, You went to college to learn that. I, well, <laughs> my, uh, my daughter and I worked very well together because oh. it was just two, uh, two brains versus one. And uh, uh, each could look at a project from a totally different uh, viewpoint and come up with many, many answers. And it was just... Uh, Eureka moment. I <laughs> said, so, thanks a lot, my daughter. <laughs> well, uh, Chris, I, I know you have um, a meeting you, you have to attend, and, and uh, we're about to run out of, of space here, but uh, maybe we could continue this on at another time when you're not involved with so many of your projects and uh, uh, talk about your acting career. Would you come back and do this for us? <laughs> I'd be happy to. One of my projects now is that I'm back on the board of of the local Tryon Fine Arts Center, which is dear to me because it was my great aunt that uh, helped establish the Fine Arts Center. Well, we can do another story just on that. We could do a whole story just on the Fine Arts Center, which is a fabulous place. And I learned from a board meeting yesterday, and I have another one to go to today, that uh, we have never been busy, as busy as we are now, in the 40 years that that building has been there. It's great. It's a beautiful facility, and I've done an interview with uh, with Beth Child. Uh, fabulous. They're just so lucky to have this this young lady here. And uh, Marianne Caruse, isn't she one of their? Um, uh, I don't know what Marianne's title is. What is it? Well, uh, she's director. Anyway, I'll I'll go uh, into she's that. cooking bottle washer. Right? She does everything she does except everything. For, except when the janitor does up. She even cleans the floor. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, no, it's a fabulous place. I, I just I'm, I'm still amazed. I call Tryon, uh, North Carolina, and Polk County, but I call it Little Cincinnati because we've got the arts and music and theater here. Only we don't have to fight traffic to see great performances. And uh, we'll have more of this ongoing from the uh, from the Arts Center from Chris Bartall. And we hope you'll stay tuned and join us because. You have any friends overseas that live any place? Because this can be heard around the world, you know, on this website, the newspaper. Anyone you'd like to say hi to? Well, of course, my son and my new daughter-in-law live in Sasebo, Japan. Oh, great. And um, uh, perhaps if they're listening, uh, uh, I'd be thrilled to say hello, Kit and Hiroko. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever you said, I'll agree. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, you've been listening to um, Chris Bartol, um, art director, photographer, actor, a man of many talents, and, um, and a good friend. And um, we're going to see him out the door to his meeting, and he may show up there an hour ahead of time because he's had more of these chocolate-covered coffee beans. <laughs> so look out. He's wound up for the meeting. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned, and remember to listen to the Voices of the Foothills, Crossroads of the World, here in, in Tryon, North Carolina. <laughs>